What is the truth about Oliver Cromwell and the Battle of Dunbar of 1650? Vladimir Lenin, a leader in the Bolshevik Revolution and in early Soviet Russia, once said that there are decades when nothing happens, and there are weeks when decades happen. This sentiment could not apply more perfectly than to the period around the Battle of Dunbar, as the history of the 17th century in these isles is, well, frankly, pretty mental. So today I've taken you to Dunbar, a town just on the east coast of Scotland, right on the North Sea. Behind me, just next to the main road, is one of the main commemorative slabs to the Battle of Dunbar of 1650. There was a Battle of Dunbar during the Scottish Wars of Independence, the first Scottish War of Independence um, as well. But this one was in the 17th century, a period of turmoil and volatility within these isles. The location of the battlefield of the Battle of Dunbar is this whole general area, many argue right down to the coast as well. But to understand this battle, we need to understand the context in which it took place. The Battle of Dunbar took place within the broader Wars of the Three Kingdoms, a series of intertwined wars between the kingdoms of Ireland, Scotland and England, with Wales essentially considered part of England at this time. Lasting around 14 years from 1639 to 1653, and sometimes referred to as the British Civil War, more major events happened in these 14 years than happened in entire centuries and other periods of history. The Wars of the Three Kingdoms included the 1639-1640 Bishops' Wars, the First and Second English Civil Wars, the Irish Confederate Wars, the brutal Cromwellian Conquest of Ireland, as well as the Anglo-Scottish War of 1650-1652. So to try and simplify these events, because they can make your head spin a little, just the complexity of the 17th century. On top of the clear religious conflicts uh, and religious sentiment around this time, many of these conflicts can be grouped into conflicts between supporters and opponents of Charles I, who was the King of Scotland, Ireland and England from 1625 until his execution in 1649. One of the main proponents of his execution is a man, an infamous man, in the history of these isles. A man called Oliver Cromwell. Now Cromwell is a figure who deserves a video all of his own. Even with a mere mention of his name, things get a little intense. He is infamous for the brutality of the conquest of Ireland between 1649 and 1653. He rose to prominence during the Wars of the Three Kingdoms as a senior commander uh, of the Parliamentarian Army and later as a politician. He famously went on to serve as Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland and Ireland, known as the Protectorate, from 1653 until his death in 1658. From commoner to head of state, the story of Cromwell has been described as one of the greatest rises of a commoner in English history, thrown up the social hierarchy by the combination of the turbulence of the time, coupled with his capabilities and viciousness. He is in fact the only English commoner to become the overall head of state, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Cromwell led the English side at the Battle of Dunbar of 1650. The Scottish side was commanded by David Leslie, a Scottish military officer who had previously served in the Swedish army during the Thirty Years' War. After Charles I was executed in early 1649, there was a constitutional crisis. While England became a republic, the rest of the domains of Charles I recognised his son, Charles II, as the rightful king, including many in Scotland. The Scots mobilised an army to press the claim of Charles II, but in June 1650, Cromwell decided on a preemptive strike and led an army of his own, of the English Republic, toward Edinburgh. Leslie called all Scottish men of military age to Edinburgh and employed a Scots earth policy in the Lowlands to impede the advance of Cromwell's army. Weather further impeded Cromwell's plan to resupply by sea, and after an initial advance towards Edinburgh, Cromwell retreated to Dunbar on the east coast of Scotland. He did, however, find an English flotilla to provide some provisions, although his army was also weakened by disease. The Scottish army pursued and took up a position on Dunhill overlooking Dunbar. 
The Scots weren't in a much better position, however. Running low on provisions and exposed on the hill, the Scots soon decided to move off the hill and closer to the English position, a logistical move that ended up taking most of the day. As far as the size of the armies, estimates vary. Some put the size of the Scottish force as high as around 23,000 troops to oppose Cromwell's army of around 11,000 infantry and cavalry. Others argue that the Scottish force was a more modest 10 to 13,000 men, probably having a slight advantage as far as troop size. The English had capable veterans amongst their ranks, however, as well as skilled commanders, who immediately spotted weaknesses in the Scottish army. The Scottish left wing, for instance, was crowded against the steep slope of Doon Hill and incapable of manoeuvring effectively. At dawn the following day, Cromwell launched his attack whilst quoting a biblical verse, Now let God arise, and his enemies shall be scattered. The Scots were surprised initially, but quickly formed up, and at first repulsed the English advance. Cromwell himself arrived with his reserves, and soon the whole English line advanced again. The fresh impulse enabled it to break the Scottish cavalry and repulse the infantry, and Leslie's line of battle was gradually rolled up from right to left. Driven into broken ground and penned between Doon Hill and a ravine, the Scots were indeed helpless. The battle was over in an hour, fewer than 100 English men perished, again some 3,000 Scots killed and about 10,000 made prisoners. There is debate, however, about whether the Scottish casualty figures are exaggerated, with others putting the number at closer to three to 500 killed and around 6,000 taken prisoner. Regardless of the precise numbers, however, it was a resounding victory for the English, who went on to abolish all native institutions in Scotland and created a new administration at Dalkeith. In the next two years, the rest of Scotland was conquered and ultimately became part of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland and Ireland, under the Lord Protector, you guessed it, Oliver Cromwell. This was a forceful occupation of Scotland, however, with 10,000 English troops occupying Scotland. Cromwell ruled as the Lord Protector until his death in 1658, with his son briefly taking over that title um, for a year or so before resigning. Ultimately, however, the, the Protectorate collapsed in 1659, and the following year, Charles II was restored to the crown, becoming King of Scotland, Ireland and England. There was turmoil only a few decades later, however, when Charles II's successor, King James, was overthrown in the Glorious Revolution of 1688 by Mary II and her husband, William of Orange. But that is a story for another time. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and hit the bell and tell your friends and family about this channel. For ways to support, um, I'll be in the description below. And please let me know your comments. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.